People talk about thinking outside the box. I'd like to start with thinking outside the galaxy. <laughs> Alien invasion. Yeah, that's what I said. Alien invasion. I'm a big sci-fi fan, and one of the scariest books I ever read was a sci-fi novel where an alien race came across the galaxy to take over our planet. They found a way to surround the entire globe with clouds. And from these clouds, it started to rain. And we just thought, oh, there's some weather. And it rained for days. And in that rain, there were seeds. And these, from the seeds grew plants. Exotic vines and flowers began to bloom everywhere. And these plants took in our oxygen and emitted their environment. Can you picture it? Without a single shot fired, they terraformed our planet and adapted our environment so they could thrive. Now, the thing that made it so scary was how logical it was. Forget all the other scenarios. Forget every sci-fi movie I've ever seen. I'm pretty sure that's how it would be done if it ever happened. So my idea for you is, why can't we take over the planet? Why can't we adapt our environment so we can thrive? I'm talking about a no holds barred, no rules, no preconceived notions on how things are supposed to be done, all out takeover. And why not start with our offices, our homes, and our city, and adapt our environment so we can fit the future? Now, adapting our environment isn't a new idea. It's just a hard one to conceptualize when you're standing in its predecessor. I'm talking about challenging our imaginations to look at the norm and expand its potential. An example I'd like to put to you is the formal living room. Now, how many of you remember the formal living room? I do. <laughs> I remember it because we weren't allowed to go in there. And we certainly weren't allowed to sit on anything, especially at my grandmother's house. You know, my brother and I thought her oriental rug was a perfect racetrack for our matchbox cars, but no. Historically, the formal living room was a large space located in the front of the house used for formal gatherings, most especially funerals and wakes. Now, somewhere along the line, somebody decided that giving all that prime real estate in a house to a room that nobody goes into with furniture nobody sits on was a really a bad idea. And likewise, that tiny enclosed kitchen in the back of the house where it was originally meant for a hired cook or just to be on the outskirts in case of fire shouldn't be the room that mom gets banished to to make dinner all by herself. And there you have it. The great room was born. It only took 75 years for us to break with what we were used to and open up that room so that young and old, male and female, could hang out in one place and go about the business of life. Humans are social animals. For all of you addicted to your phones, I'm sure you would agree. <laughs> But today, you've got mom and making dinner, kids doing homework, dad checking his email, all in one great room. A great example of adapting our environment so we can thrive. Which leads me to an important part of any alien invasion, the aliens. Now, the Oxford Dictionary def definition of alien is unfamiliar and disturbing. Now, the tone of that sounds a bit negative, doesn't it? Well, is it really? I like unfamiliar. And disturbing to who? I thrive on the unfamiliar. I seek it out wherever I go. It's new and different. And disturbing? Well, 
Disturbing implies making waves and disrupting the norm. I like that too. Most artists do. You know who you are. I might just love these new aliens. How many of you have heard somebody say that young people today have no attention span or work ethic? Have you heard them say that they have the attention span of a YouTube video? I have. I'd like to introduce you to the possibility that you are proposing sending them into the formal living room of the future, and they're just not interested. <laughs> They might be unfamiliar and disturbing, but young people today are brought up with more knowledge, entertainment, and news at their fingertips than you or I could ever have imagined at their age. They're sponges in this media-driven world we've created. They have been exposed to a tremendous amount of input, so much so that maybe it doesn't fit right in a cubicle or an assembly line. We might just need to adapt our work environment for the new workforce ahead, for the new aliens and the new alien invasion. Many years back, I remember visiting Boston and spending time with my niece, Madison. I asked her if she was excited about being in her final year of elementary school. She said, what do you mean? I'm in my first year of middle school. I was like, wow. That's crazy. We finished in the sixth grade with a diploma and a ceremony and everything. Why did they change it? And she stood up and faced me, their hands on her hips, and said, they can't keep us with the little kids. We know too much. Well, there you have it. Unfamiliar and disturbing, but true. They, they have grown up in a global social atmosphere where everyone has an all-access pass. Many times we send young people into a work environment that might as well be a scene from a black and white movie. But it's time to rethink our perception of normal. It's time to adapt our environment so we can all thrive. We need to evolve to inspire we can't expect new people to fit in an old mold. I propose stepping outside of our preconceived world and rethinking the architecture and design of the workplace to inspire creativity, productivity, and happiness. I hate to quote dirty dancing, but nobody puts <laughs> baby in a corner is a relevant point. <laughs> Have you ever been asked to sit at a desk facing a wall? I have. It's awful. During one office redesign when I was in New York, a carpenter built desk surrounding the entire perimeter of the room. I couldn't take it. I can't create facing a wall. Nobody could. The first thing we did was figure out a way to build peninsula desks jutting off the sides so we could all face each other and generate a better energy in the room. The results were phenomenal. Companies like Google and Southwest have figured this out. They've broken boundaries in design. They've created treehouse conference rooms and treadmill think tanks and proved that the F word, fun, does have its place in the workplace. If we could terraform our city with fun, what would it look like? Would people travel from near and far to see it? If we built it, would they come? Would it bring back the days of the great American road trip where people couldn't wait to get off the highway and see what a town had to offer? Would we take a picture at a 30-foot pair of cowboy boots, eat breakfast at the giant donut, or spend our day in a climbing wall in Central Park? I'm in the process of mounting a spinning cowboy on the roof of our building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a serious link between fun, happiness, and productivity. And I have to agree. Fun is an amazing motivational tool. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. 
Suddenly, an office isn't just an office, and a job isn't just a job, and my team aren't just employees. For many years, I ran the design department at a large fashion house in New York, and I always had at least five young interns at a time. Now, on the other side of the office, the sales department had the same amount of interns, but they never stayed more than two weeks. They constantly ask me, how do you get your interns to stay all summer? Now, what I wanted to say was, I'm not boring them to tears, and I don't treat them like mindless drones created to do my bidding, but in all honesty, it was the simple method of making them part of the entire process. Letting them know what essential part they were playing in the big picture and why whether they were Xeroxing, learning to draw specs, creating a repeat for a textile design, all jobs that could be really tedious. They were involved and invested. Magically, when you show them what essential part they play in the big picture and let them participate in the finish, the light bulb goes on and you see the pride in their faces. My happy aliens. Being an essential part of the process changes the importance of the job. Once I overheard one of my interns on the phone to her folks saying, I'm not just an intern, I'm involved in what happens here. <laughs> and they were. Participating in the finish is the icing on the cake. For them, it was the fashion show. If you are enjoying yourself, you will work harder, longer, and be a more fulfilled person. It's the whole story. And it satisfies that all access pass their minds have grown to expect. I still hear from some of the interns I worked with in New York. When I took my family to visit my old office in New York, the current design team asked me to autograph my desk. They'd heard so many stories about the girl who changed the design room, invented the party closet, and hung the giant disco ball. <laughs> yeah, I've always been nuts. <laughs> One of my favorite sayings that I truly believe is, your vibe attracts your tribe. And I've found mine. I make cowboy boots for a living. I'm working in an industry that is traditionally set in its ways but not in my shop. <laughs> With unorthodox interior design and organization, we continuously adapt our environment. Like myself, most of the young people I work with were asked at some point in their education to give up their art and get a real job. Or switch to a more mainstream major. Understandable, but sad. Today, there are more opportunities for artists than ever before. Game, product, web, virtual, textile, advertising, fashion, cinematic, you name it, there are tons of opportunities. And their unique talents make them a commodity, not a liability. I am lucky to work with these brilliant young minds. Our alien crew doesn't really fit the typical mold. We've got a sculptor, a costume designer, a graffiti artist, an architect, a mechanical engineer, and now a linguist. We're kind of the Power Rangers of boot making. <laughs> <laughs> but what does this menagerie prove? This cross culture of talent proves that artists just want to create. And we've all adapted to thrive. We've tried something new and we've made it work. And as long as we're creating, we're happy. Crossing the boundaries of your own education can be an uncomfortable necessity for your own success and happiness. Breaking out of that educational living room, I know that my stepdaughter, the anthropologist coffee roaster, would agree. But her new life is satisfying, her passion. It's OK. Mashups are cool and trendy. And they make you sound like a superhero. I'm a 
fine artist bootmaker married to a biologist photographer. What are you? Or what should you be? These new aliens are the movers, shakers, and makers of our future. I appeal to everyone to step outside the preconceived notions of success and design, because work and workplace go hand in hand. I appeal to everyone to embrace change in their environment and have fun. <laughs> Join with young minds to explore the possibilities of the future. I encourage cities to fight the homogenized sameness, to champion the local and the unique. We can evolve to inspire and terraform our world. That's all we need for my alien invasion. Thank you.